Hey everyone, we're going to talk about biosynthesis continuing, looking at some other types of molecules. Remember that we have looked at the biosynthesis of lipids so far. Uh, and here we're looking at molecules like amino acids and nucleotides and some other related molecules, small molecule um, and notably nitrogen containing molecules. So we're gonna look at nitrogen fixation, how we take nitrogen and utilize it uh, into biomolecules and then the biosynthesis amino, amino acids and other products of amino acids. In particular, biosynthetic pathways for amino acids, nucleotides, and lipids are actually very old. They date back to older organisms, um, and that is they share common pathways, again, that are older pathways in the degradation pathway. So they're kind of interconnected in this way between biosynthesis and degradation. And a reminder that amino acids are building blocks for proteins, right? So by biosynthesizing these building blocks, the amino acids, we can then utilize those to build proteins. Um, and there are of course other nucleotide compounds that can be utilized by amino acids uh, that are you know, made up of parts of amino acids such as signaling hormones or neurotransmitters. So we're gonna go into, again, this nitrogen fixation, um, how we get nitrogen or other organisms get nitrogen and then utilize it, amino acid biosynthetic pathways, and then the regulation of those pathways. Um, and then again, amino acids as these precursors for other types of molecules like porphins. Nitrogen is a very important element of the main organic elements that we look at. Remember that hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon are other important chemical elements that are utilized in organic compounds. Um, it's a major element in living organism. And it mostly is subsiding in our nucleic acids and our proteins from our amino acids. But it also can be found in other varieties of small molecules. Think about things like NAD, FAD, and biotin. These are all vitamin-derived molecules. Uh, they are not amino acids, they're not nucleic acids, but they do compromise a lot of their skeleton, chemical skeleton of nitrogen. Things like hormones and epinephrine. Uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin, pigments in plants and other um, organisms that use things like chlorophyll or even in animals where you see pigments as well. And even in some organisms that use defensive like chemicals. So am ammonitin, excuse me, is one of these examples. So because we're talking about our uh, nitrogen compounds, it's important to distinguish what type of nitrogen source uh, chemically we are talking about. So just a reminder back to chemistry, uh, and just nitrogen, elemental nitrogen actually exists in a diatomic form as N2. That's what is in the air as nitrogen. Um, there's also nitrates, uh, which is NO3. Um, the eight means a higher oxidation state. This is when we're thinking about the nitrogen in its higher oxidation state. Nitrite is NO2. It is the light version, light on oxygen and oxidation state. <laughs> That's how you can remember between nitrate and nitrite. Uh, so nitrate, NO3, nitrite, NO2. And then ammonia is an H3, so no oxygen here. Um, it also has a nitrogen in the oxidation state of negative three. 
So nitrogen fixation, being able to take nitrogen out of the environment as these compounds I just talked about, just pure nitrogen, nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia is carried out by a very select amount of organisms. So things like anaerobic microorganisms are a great example. And they allow for the initial construction of amino acids. This is something that we as humans cannot do. Uh, and only these select organisms have the ability to actually take nitrogen from inorganic sources and make it into biological sources. The carbon backbones for amino acids also comes from glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and pentose phosphate pathway, all of which also exist in our anaerobic microorganisms. Remember, these pathways for breaking down carbon and breaking down glucose are very ancient pathways. Um, and most all uh, organisms, many varieties of organisms that we know of are utilizing these for energy consumption. The microorganisms that are doing nitrogen fixation use ATP and ferrodoxin, which we saw when looking at carbohydrate biosynthesis in our plant chapter. And they reduce atmospheric nitrogen, that's that N2 in the atmosphere, to ammonia. This is one of the many things that they can do. About 60% of all nitrogen fixation is done just by these microorganisms. About 15% of nitrogen fixation is done by lightning and UV radiation. So by um, natural processes of these high energy events, you can actually have nitrogen from the environment fixed into um, other types of nitrogen like ammonia. And then 25% of the um, atmospheric nitrogen is actually industrial processed into um, ammonia using something called the Haber's process. So nitrogen fixation by the Haber's process, the indus industrial synthesis of ammonia was a big deal in its time and it still is um, heavily relied upon. It's one of mankind's most significant chemical processes and it's what made chemical fertilizer uh, possible. When you go buy fertilizer from the store, if you have a lot of house plants like me, then um, maybe you, you go buy miracle Grow or something. Chemical fertilizers um, use nitrogen sources because plants need nitrogen and they fix nitrogen. Uh, and they use ammonia in particular and other nitrates and nitrites. And to be able to get those sources of nitrogen, we were able to uh, industrialize a process to take nitrogen from the air and make it into these sources that are usable in fertilizer. In plants and in bacteria, the fixation process of taking nitrogen and building molecules is carried out by a nitrogenase complex. It's a very slow process um, due to the triple bond in nitrogen. So remember that N2 actually looks like this. It has a triple bond connecting the two nitrogens. So it's a very slow process um, because of this high activation energy between the triple bond. The whole complex has two subunits, the dinitrogenase reductase portion and then just the dinitrogenase portion. And again, it's going to use ATP to overcome the activation energy and ultimately fix this nitrogen. So about 16 ATPs are consumed per one molecule of nitrogen that is fixed. Here's that net reaction for nitrogen fixation in the nitrogenase complex. You can see electrons are reduced first by ferrodoxin. There's our friend ferrodoxin in the um, reductase portion of the complex. Then ATP is used, leaving ADP, remember 16 ATP are used. 
uh, and the electrons are moved to the nitrogenase complex portion. And in this portion, our nitrogen is actually bound and turned into ammonia. It takes a transfer of eight electrons in complex one and the hydrolysis of ATP, which releases protons. This is where the H comes from to bind up to our nitrogen. We start with N2, we end with NH3. The hydrolysis of the ATP actually causes a conformational change in the protein and that helps to aid with the transfer of electrons into the second portion, the nitrogenase portion. So you have to do that hydrolysis of the ATP first to kind of reform the protein to allow for the second step to happen. The electrons are transferred again into complex two uh, in which you're actually forming the NH3. There's a transfer of two electrons to protons forming H2, which is then utilized. Um, the main portion of this that is catalyzing the reaction, you can see uh, there is this iron sulfur complex and molybdenum as well. So you can see this green and yellow, these are iron sulfur complexes. We've talked about these before way back in electron transport chain. And you can see there's also molybdenum that is bound that is allowing for this catalysis reaction. It is this iron molybdenum cofactor together that is responsible for the reduction of atmospheric nitrogen. The nitrogen actually binds in, you can see it in blue here, to the center of this complex, this molybdenum iron sulfur cage, you can call it, and is coordinated by the molybdenum atom. It's still poorly understood exactly how this is happening, um, but there are two possible mechanisms as to how um, the process of taking the nitrogen uh, in that coordinated step and making the NH3 is occurring. So you can see either, um, either double bonds are existing first between the uh, hydrogen, hydrated nitrogen here and the nitrogen that's coordinated to the molybdenum here or vice versa. Right, so it's it's where the bonds are located is the two um, plausible mechanisms as they are moving about. But you can see generally what is happening is you're binding the nitrogen, you're forming this uh, diazinido complex in which hydrogen is bound to a double bond in nitrogen while coordinated to the molybdenum. And then eventually you are releasing this NH3 um, while releasing from the molybdenum. So as a overview of this complex, uh, the beginning of it actually starts with pyruvate in microorganisms. Pyruvate is what is passing electrons to ferrodoxin or flavodoxin, this is in um, plants. These then pass electrons to the dinitrogenase reductase portion of that complex. The reductase passes it to the dinitrogenase portion. And then the dinitrogenase passes electrons to nitrogen itself or to protons, depending on the mechanism you look at, to make NH3. A side reaction to this is also the formation of hydrogen gas during this processing. Okay, so once we have formed the actual ammonia, remember that this is occurring in our microorganisms and some plants which can fix nitrogen from 
the air as well. So once you've actually taken nitrogen from the air and formed ammonium, how do we take the ammonium ion and assimilate it into organisms such as making it into amino acids? Well, the main amino acids that we assimilate nitrogen into are the same ones that we usually use for removal of nitrogen. Um, glutamate and glutamine, these are our nitrogen carrying molecules. Uh, we noted in the chapter about breakdown and removal of nitrogen, breakdown of amino acids, breakdown and removal of nitrogen. We noted that glutamate and glutamine are often in higher proportions than their other amino acids uh, because of their roles of nitrogen carriers, as you can see, to help assimilate nitrogen in or to help rid of excess nitrogen during catabolic processes. Of course, once you assimilate the nitrogen and make glutamate or glutamine, that nitrogen can then be transferred around using our transamination reactions. So enzymes that can transfer the nitrogen group from one amino acid to make another amino acid allows for the um, biosynthesis of these other amino acids. So how is the actual glutamine or glutamate made? Um, it's made in a two-step process. Glutamine is made um, by a enzyme called glutamine synthase. Uh, and through this, we take, you can see glutamate and ATP, and then using the same compound, uh, glutamine synthase, take glutamyl phosphate. So we've basically phosphorylated a glutamate, and then we can add in our ammonia group here, making glutamine. So taking glutamate and making glutamine allows us to add in ammonium. Now this can occur in um, organisms such as humans ourselves. We can take ammonia from carriers and process it through glutamate synthase by transferring glutamine synthase, excuse me, by transferring that ammonia onto a glutamine. Biosynthetic pathways for amino acids generally are grouped into families based on their precursors. So just like we can take amino acids and turn them into certain byproducts, the opposite is true as well. Um, there are only so many amino acids that can be made from some name precursors. For example, um, alpha ketoglutarate, this is a base um, molecule related to the citric acid cycle, can be turned into glutamate, glutamine, proline, or arginine, but only these amino acids. So you can see uh, there are different pathways that allow for the formation of different amino acids, such as pentose phosphate pathway. We can take ribose 5-phosphate and make histidine. Um, glycolysis leads to the, a variety of, of products such as 3-phosphoglycerate, um, phosphophenopyruvate, and etherose 4-phosphate. These are all intermediates in glycolysis, and these can be turned into different amino acids. Citric acid cycle as well, as I just noted, um, leads to things like alpha ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate, which can be used for specific amino acids. All in all, glycolysis is the main provider of the carbon backbones for our amino acids though. This is just an overview of that biosynthetic um, pathways leading in. Again, this is very similar to the opposite. Excuse me. <laughs> when we are breaking down amino acids into their representative um, 
precursor compounds, you can go the opposite way as well. So many amino acids only have specific precursors they can be broken down into. Ones that are derived from alpha ketoglutarate are of particular importance. Um, this includes some uh, glutamate, glutamine, proline, and arginine. Now, the glutamine, proline, and arginine are essentially derived from glutamate, uh, but glutamate can be directly made from alpha ketoglutarate. In animals, we can also use orthanine to be converted into arginine or proline using orthanine aminotransferase. Orthanine fits into the urea cycle where it can directly make arginine. So this is kind of that connection again into the breakdown process. So orthanine aminotransferase converts orthanine to glutamate gamma semialdehyde, which can cyclize into proline. Things that are de derived from three Phosphoglycerate include serine, um, which can be directly made, and then glycine and cysteine, which can be produced from serine. This is through a long series of steps. Um, and you can see that even though our 3-phosphoglycerate is our starting material, glutamate is still used as a source of nitrogen during the process to make um, serine and also glycine. Cysteine in particular, um, the conversion of and production of cysteine from serine essentially actually has to occur from homocysteine and com combination with serine. Again, this is in animals. Um, they form a complex called cystocyanine, which can then be lysed. And you see there is a, a transference of ammonia through this process. Again, through uh, a series of transferases to form our final cysteine. So while our ammonia is present on the homocysteine coming in, there is one on the serine that is coming in as well. You actually lose an ammonia during this process as you cleave that cystocyanine while forming cysteine. So again, this is just a reminder that these processes of actually biosynthetically adding ammonia and removing ammonia are very interlocked, especially when it comes to amino acids. It's more of a transfer of, of ammonia um, and less of strict incorporation and loss of it. Things that are derived from oxaloacetate and pyruvate, um, there are many, you can actually see here, oxaloacetate can lead to aspartate, um, which leads to asparagine, methionine, lysine, threonine. Um, threonine can kind of connect these two by making isoleucine. Pyruvate makes alanine, valine, leucine, and isoleucine. One of the main transfer transaminase reactions we looked at actually include this oxaloacetate to aspartate. This was the aspartate transaminase. And also the pyruvate to alanine. We talked about the Cori cycle connecting these two together. This is the alanine transaminase reaction. So this two, these two are very important. Okay, so we also looked at some more complex uh, glucose-derived molecules, including phosphophenol pyruvate and erythrose 4-phosphate, which includes some very complicated chemistry to make our ringed molecules, including phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and ty well, tyrosine can be made also from phenylalanine. 
So these rings actually are synthesized, closed, and then oxidized to create double bonds. So it's a complicated system, um, but it, it commonly uses chorus mate as an intermediate. This is the intermediate ring structure, chorus mate, that is found uh, that can then be turned into these other amino acids that have rings. Okay, so we generally went over the um, transferous, transferring of ammonia into amino acids and how you can form different amino acids from ammonia coming in, right? Let's look at the regulation for amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, it's often a multi-layered approach using feedback inhibition from products. Remember, this is just the very general idea that if you have too much products, that will inhibit making more products. That's feedback inhibition. <laughs> and then also use of isozymes for regulation of specific pathways. For example, several pathways share um, this compound, 5-phosphoribosyl-1-pyrophosphate, which is also just abbreviated as PRPP. This is a common intermediate for many amino acids. Again, synthesized from ribose 5-phosphate of the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, and it is a highly regulated enzyme, the ribose phosphate pyrophosphokinase that forms this is highly regulated. Here's an example of allosteric regulation in the isoleucine biosynthesis. So this is going from threonine to isoleucine. Um, this is just, again, feedback inhibition, right? When there is a lot of isoleucine, it can actually inhibit the enzyme threonine dehydratase, which takes threonine and ultimately makes isoleucine. Because aspartate is so connected to many amino acids, remember we can take oxaloacetate and make aspartate using one of the main Tran amino transferases, um, aspartate transaminase. Aspartate controls a lot of the formation of many amino acids. So this pathway is very regulated. There are three enzymes, which are labeled here, A, B, and C, and they either have two or three isoforms. This is other versions, another version of that enzyme. Um, so you can see there's a1, A2, A3. Uh, these are different, slightly different forms of the same enzyme, B1 and B2, and C1 and C2. The isozymes are very important um, for regulation. And they do this. So for example, if aspartate can lead to making lysine, methionine, um, threonine and isoleucine, the use of all isozymes, all regulated by different effectors, allows for amino acids when needed. So for example, if I go back here, you can see that lysine only blocks this isoform 1A. So 1A2 or A3 can still take aspartate and make s B phosphate. Now notice that threonine only box A3. So if I have a lot of lysine and I have a lot of threonine, can I still make other products? Well, A2 would still function, you can see. B1 and B2 are not, or B2 is blocked by threonine, but B1 would still function, making homoserine. Now, homoserine can continue to make methionine, and notice that through this 
version, homocerine is not blocked unless there is too much methionine. So by utilizing these different isoforms and only blocking certain isoforms with certain end products, you can kind of cater towards the pathway that you're, do, you're utilizing um, to make the particular compounds you need. There are other important metabolites that are derived from amino acids after you fix the nitrogen and then you make the amino acid. These include things like porphyrin rings. These are those rings such as heme that we have seen. Um, also things like cytochrome C. This is also a porphyrin based similar ring. Phosphocreatine. Uh, this is a very important molecule found in the serum. Glutathione. Glutathione we've talked about as a molecule important for stress regulation um, and decreasing oxidative stress. So removing those radicals such as peroxides that can be present. Also neurotransmitters. Many of the neurotransmitters are just based on amino acids. Um, this is why amino acids such as tryptophan are so important for making things like serotonin. So one example of this is glycine, which is one of the main components of heme um, and porphyrins in, in general. Porphyrins make up heme, which is of course a part of hemoglobin. It's a part of, uh, porphyrins are also a part of cytochromes and myoglobin. Um, cytochromes, again, cytochrome C is a good example of that. Um, porphyrin can be created from glycine with succinyl CoA. And uh, the pathway generates, again, these intermediates. Uh, one of the important intermediates is gamma amino vulnerate and um, porphobilogen is also an important in intermediate. Porphobilogen and the bilogen compounds are actually found often excreted um, and they are markers that change your pee color. So your pee is yellow and it has a color to it because of these um, porphyrin derived bilogen molecules. Um, as I just noted, heme is a source of our bile pigments in general. It's degraded by the erythrocytes into bilirubin um, and ultimately excreted. It's one of the major pigments for urine. The, the excreted form in urine is urobilin, and then it can be further in, uh, degraded by our intestinal microbiota into stero, stericobilin, which is found in feces. Now, there can be deficits in heme biosynthesis. Most animals are able to synthesize their own heme from glycine, as just mentioned, but certain mutations and misregulation of the enzymes important for heme biosynthesis can lead to um, disruption of your porphyrin molecules or porphyrias, that's this um, cleaving of porphyrins. These precursors then accumulate in, bread, in red blood cells um, and body fluids and liver, and they accumulate because you can't, you keep trying to make more heme, but instead you're making these other byproducts. So accumulation of the precursor uroforophyrogen one can lead to things like urine becoming discolored, pink or dark purplish color sometimes become because of the light. So it's a pigmented um, precursor that will end up in the urine. You can see teeth that may show red fluorescence under UV light or skin sensitive to UV light um, and also a craving for heme. So craving for meat and blood um, to take in the actual heme molecule that's found in hemoglobin. 
This is actually where a lot of the biochemical basis for vampire myths come from. Um, this, this inability to synthesize heme, um, and then you have discoloration, you have a reaction to light, UV light, you're sensitive to UV light, and you crave blood and um, meat. Here's the overall reaction for the formation and breakdown of bilirubin. Uh, this is if you are breaking down heme. Um, this is a natural process. We, we often recycle heme, break it down and make new heme. And you can see essentially you take a molecule, um, break it into these pieces and through the process, make either urobilin excreted in the urine or stericobilin. One of the other molecules I mentioned was phosphocreatine. So glycine and arginine are precursors together for creatine and phosphocreatine, which is hydrolyzed in our muscles for energy. This is another specific source of muscle energy. You might have heard of phosphocreatine if you ever take supplements for exercising. Uh, this is why it is sold. Um, but generally it is coming from glycine arginine and another metabolite called S-adenosyl methionine. It can be phosphorylated by ATP and then stored essentially. Uh, and then that phosphate can then be released as an energy source if needed by muscles. Our glutathione, again, used for the reduction of those oxidative species is derived from um, our glutamate, cytosine, and glycine. You can see glycine is very important. <laughs> And through this process of kind of cobbling these glutamate, cysteine, and glycine together, you get glutathione. You can actually see the pieces of it labeled out right here. Remember, this is what helps remove those toxic um, peroxides and other oxidative um, stressors. Many of the neurotransmitters are um, derived from different precursors like tyrosine, glutamate, tryptophan, and histidine. Notice it's many of the ringed compounds. Again, tyrosine, histidine, and tryptophan have a ring component to them that lead to the neurotransmitters, which often also have rings. You can see epinephrine here, which is derived from tyrosine, um, histamine derived from histidine, and serotonin, which is derived from tryptophan. Uh, glutamate is actually responsible for GABA, which is called um, aminobutyrate, or it's uh, gamma aminobutyrate, which is where we get the GABA name from. So one of the very important neurotransmitters trans comes from one of the most important amino acids, which is glutamate. And finally, arginine is a precursor for a molecule, nitric acid. Um, nitric acid plays an important role in blood pressure regulation, blood clotting, um, et cetera. And this is synthesized from arginine and interestingly, NADPH, not NADH. Um, and you can see it goes through this process of using NAD pH here and also oxygen incoming with another NADH to make nitric oxide. It also creates citrulline during the process, which is important in the, um, the urea cycle for processing out ammonia. All right, well, that is it for our um, look at amino acid biosynthesis. Next up, we're going to continue looking at our uh, biosynthesis of 
nucleotides.